Hey everybody, your old pal Todd Dammit here. Today, once again brought to you by my favorite charity, People for Animals. Uh, today, getting a chance to talk to someone very special. Uh, they say never meet your heroes, but on this occasion, I think it's absolutely awesome. He uh, has been one of my all-time favorite uh, bass players and in one of my top three favorite bands of all time. Uh, now I'm lucky enough to call him a friend. How do you like that? Ladies and gentlemen, Duff McKagan. And we are live. Oh my God! Can you know, you I, I just want to, you know, because you, you're 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 Canadian. <laughs> I appreciate is this it. about to get like really racist <laughs> oh, right. no. Uh, no. i'm gonna ask you uh can i move yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, you're almost there yeah i'm almost there um what about release the kraken dude i'm so excited i've actually been looking for a t-shirt so seattle has it's a very own nhl hockey team for the first time ever i mean I, it's never really had a I, there, there was like AH, AHL teams and stuff, but there was. We had the totems that was like in the mm. '70s when I was a little kid. Yeah, I yeah. got a hockey puck, and I I remember like uh, hitting my brother in the head with a hockey puck. <laughs> as uh, you do, as you do, and then <laughs> yeah. we, you know we had a team in 1919. That's right, an wow. NHL team one, one year, and they won the Stanley Cup, and they moved. They were the Metropolitans, which is That's a right. great name, and I thought they should have called them that. That would, been, that would have been really dope. Wasn't there like a, the Seals? No, it's California, California Seals. I'm sorry. Yeah, that would, Metropolitans would have been really cool, yeah. But of course, you know, we, it's Seattle. So we have, a, we have a football team, the Seahawks, a, a bird that doesn't exist. And now we have a, a hockey team of a mythical sea monster. <laughs> that doesn't exist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that sounds interesting. Well, that's actually really good for the city. I think it's really great for everything. Even living, living in Vegas right now, yeah. And the Raiders have done, I think they've won the last two games or something like that. I don't they really follow. Lost last weekend, but they're, uh -oh. they're, they're a real team this year. That's for sure. It's yeah. very interesting watching this city because I've been living here long enough to watch, you know, the Knights come in and just completely galvanize this city as far as like, you know, having an identity. I never really thought about it that much, I think, because I've always grown up in Canada. We've always had hockey teams. And yeah. then like just seeing that, you know, that the one day that doesn't exist, the next day that logo is everywhere. You know, it's like, it really brings people together. I, I, I would assume Seattle, because your whole life, it's been the Mariners, you Seahawks. know. It's a big Seahawks town. I mean, if the Mariners, it's a Mariners town, but it, the Mariners have been awful for so long that it's, 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 it's hard. And we I lost hard. Sonics. And that was, right. a, that was a huge dagger because it's a big basketball town. Totally. Um, you know, it, it left here with Westbrook and Durant as rookies. Wow. Ouch. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. so it was really painful. Um, Where did the Sonics go? Where did that... that uh... Well, they stayed here because the heart of the Sonics well, is still here. We'll that's true. Back. That's, that's true, yeah. To Oklahoma City. So Oklahoma, right, yeah. There was that old thing, you know, where a new guy came in and bought it from uh, Howard Schultz, the CEO of Starbucks, who owned him. That's right. And signed a contract. He'll never move the team. Came out with this press conference. I would never move the team. You no. move the team. <laughs> well, a large CEO lying to the people? That never happens. Come on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Some guy from Oklahoma City. Yeah, the guy from Oklahoma City owned, like, he owns energy, you know. Yeah, uh, exactly. I'll yeah. never move the team. The fine was $13 million to move the team. And well, he, never paid, he actually never paid it. Really? Yeah, it's these like some change to him. You know? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Th th these dudes, they just yeah, that doesn't that doesn't even phase them. It's weird because now you've lost a basketball team, and now Toronto in Canada has a basketball team that won like last last year or whatever it was the year before. I can't remember. Uh, so last year, last yeah, year. last year, yeah. Was I? I mean, we were like, wow. I mean, getting that kind of uh, in an NBA you know championship was a was a big deal. It's a great city, you know. It is, yeah. I mean, Toronto's amazing, but but let's let's hang in Seattle for a minute because I'm really fascinated by. I mean, your story in general to me is is such an interesting one because I always think about you in. Uh, I always think about you. End of sentence. No, just kidding. Uh. <laughs> no, but as a musician myself, um, when you play guitar and you play drums and you and you yeah. sing and you 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 you've been had the ability and you've done worn all those hats. 
So when you're sitting into as a bass player, because I do this too, when I'm playing bass, um, it's that sort of interesting thing between the drums and the guitar. You're sort of meshed in there, kind of as an, I always call it an ambassador between, because a guitar player does what he's doing. He largely just, as long as you're playing in time with him, he's just going to do what he's doing. And he's not paying attention to the push here and the, the down thing here and the quarter note there. And as a bass player, you're sort of like, you have to play the notes with the guitar player. And then you, and then you have to kind of find the groove with the drummer. So I'm assuming in your world, and you started as a drummer, I'm correct. Am I yeah. correct? Uh, so, basically, you know, I started kind of on all three. Right. Was at that magical age when you can, Just, I can do anything. Yeah, exactly, yeah. But I would assume sitting down and coming up with lines, it's just kind of like, you know, you're hearing the whole song. It's my, my point in reality is like, you're hearing the entire song, you're listening to the singer. I know that you're, you're kind of like this satellite in the middle of it all, kind of like you're, you're connected yeah. to everything. And I think that that's such an interesting thing to, to learn. And I would assume it came pretty naturally for you. Right. Well, you, I mean, you, you kind of nailed it all, Todd. I mean, you, the things you said about it is, um, especially you and I played with the same guitar player, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and I played with other, like, I've got to jam with and play gigs with a lot of really, from, from Billy Gibbons to, yeah. you know, that, there's a guy Yeah. Um, that, you know, you're playing like Texas Shuffle and you got to play it real. You can't half step that. You no, know? I know. No pun intended. I'm fully uh, intimidated by that whole hang, that whole Austin hang, the Nashville hang. Like those right. guys are like, you know, it's a whole other thing. Yeah. It's a thing. And yeah. like the signals and the th that, that one finger up and the thing. Yeah, yeah you're three, like, three, <laughs> you know? And so, uh, but let's, let's, you have to be with a, like with Billy Gibbons or a Slash. Slash, the guitar player should, he should be able to go. Yeah, absolutely. Whatever he wants, you know, when he pays attention to what you guys are doing, that's only kind of like at maybe the end of a song, mm -hmm. or, you know, breakdown. Um, uh, I played with Slash for so many years that I know every little oh, head movement and thing. Or, or you know, we got sometimes you got to go over and tap his toe, like we're moving <laughs> on to Randy. Yeah. Um, you get to do that, dude. I, I, yeah, like, I played, we played, there's a, there's a version on, on, on uh, YouTube of a half hour, 30 minute version of Rocket Queen. I never thought wow. to go tap his toe. The song is what, six minutes long. So that's 24 minutes right. of guitar solo. <laughs> I've, seen, I've seen you guys do, I went to the Roxy and saw you guys. I've yeah. seen you guys do that, you yeah, know, yeah. a bunch of times. But the Roxy was, and I was sitting there with Billy Duffy. And we're that's just right. in the back booth, you know. Yeah. And that solo started and, and. Like, okay, we're in. Okay, it's going to come out now. No. <laughs> no, I'm all in mode. And I think that might have been one of those 30 minutes. Yeah, I kind of always appreciate that because I think, you know, if you're going to go see Miles Davis, you know, or, you know, someone like that, you would expect that there's going to be a moment where he's going to throw down, you know. Yeah. This is called Slash featuring da 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 da, da And it's kind of like he should be able to just do whatever he wants. And like you yeah, said, it's like I'm yeah. sort of there – when you become the bass player, it's sort of a support position in a sense. If, if, if the guitar player is noticing you, it's usually because there's something wrong, you know, or not, 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 not noticing you, but he's sort of like, you're sort of there to kind of, you just go fly. We're here to kind of hold down the fort, as it were. But you're, I mean, okay, so, so that's that. So the guitar player should be able to run and yeah. go. And you're, mm -hmm. you're kind of, I kind of feel like I have a fishing reel sometimes, and I'm right. reeling it in and letting it go, reeling it in. Right. And, and the drummer, you know, you have to have super great communication with, with the drummer. You guys got to, you're the thing that's driving the whole thing. And right. we all know any band with a shitty drummer is yeah. going to be a shitty band. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. it. Absolutely, right? yeah. So uh, you got to, you know, make sure to, as I mean, talking to young bass players right now is what I'm doing. You know, make sure. Yeah. When I see a young band, I see a really good rhythm section. Make you guys stay together. Totally. Make totally sure whatever mine stay together um, absolutely because there's that, that, that's you can go and and be whatever you want to do you the two people most i think you know the singer's a super important thing of the band this is the guitar, absolutely the guitar player is super important but without that rhythm section they can just be average yeah know? absolutely yeah for sure absolutely um, so you got to have all the pieces, and um, and I think our piece as bass players is, uh, you know, it's it's funny, you know. Yeah, I never got into it for the 
the glory. Mm-hmm. Never got into it for the money. You know? Right, right, right. Maybe, maybe you know, when I was 13, like- For seven, the chicks. Like, Suddenly, <laughs> like a sixteen-year-old girl was interested in me. Yeah, uh, sure. Yeah. Me and I'm like, whoa, that's, yeah. that's something else. Yeah, uh, exactly. That'll work. You yeah, know? yeah, that's that's but incentive really, enough. That's cool, you know, right? But really, it was like I I was so in love with uh, my older brothers and sisters' music. Sure. And they yeah. all played, and I wanted to be as cool as they were. Right. And that was my my original impetus for this thing, Todd. And and and. And punk rock hit right when I, again, with that big family that I had, you, everybody yeah. wanted something of their own. And punk rock was my own thing. I was like, it was my big, huge aha moment. And we had DOA up the street in Vancouver. Yeah, yeah, I know. And, and uh, they became, you know, I had Kiss Alive one. Be- sure. I bought it because of the record cover. I bought that and Pat Travers putting it straight. Wow, okay, interesting. Okay. Only because of the record, I was like 12, I had a paper route. I just want to point out, Pat Pat Travers Canadian, so you know. He's a Canadian. (laughs) (laughs) That's what Canadians do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) But the front of that record cover is he's like, he's going into the record, you know, company guy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And the back, it's all blown up and he's he's rocked him out. I'm like, I'm going to buy that record. Absolutely, yeah. Um, Kiss Alive won, really kind of like, I had the tennis racket, you know. Sure. Yeah. But it's three chords, and what a perfect introductory record into Never Mind the Bullocks. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Three chords. Yeah. It's more, more my, th- now I'm 13. Now this is more like angry and pissed off. And totally. Not like, not everybody knows about it. It's my own thing. Yeah. Um, but really, like, and then it playing, I got into a band. My first band I played bass in. Okay. Uh, the Me band, too. That's what yeah. I started on bass, too, yeah. Um, I, would, I could play guitar. I played the, with Span Paul's Veins. We made a single. Cool. 1979. How old are you at this point? So I was four, 14, my first wow. single. Where did, yeah. What did you record this on? In a proper studio or in somebody's 8-track? or? The guitar player bought a PA. Okay. Bought a PA. We rehearsed in my mom's basement. He bought this P, like a PVPA. If you bought the PA... This place, American Music in Seattle, had just got a little studio, a gate cool. track studio. And you could record three songs and they would press wow. five hundred singles. No way. So yeah. you actually your first recordings were vinyl, like a vinyl single type things? Yeah, single. Yeah. That's it's insane. Out yeah. It's out there. That's um, so crazy. Yeah, that's gotta be worth some 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 coin. Some some Japanese collectors out there got them all from. I think there's a, uh, yeah, I think it's, I don't have an original copy. I you guess. don't? Oh, wow. I think they're like, yeah, they're like $500 or something, you know, as that stuff is. I, I, yeah. Of course. Of course, yeah. Uh, but then the, the, some friends of mine uh, that turned into the Fastbacks, they, they were called yeah. Red and, and Kurt Block, the guitar player, played drums. Right. And, and they asked me if I, because Kurt's a guitar player. So right, they, yeah. If I would play drums, they had a drum kit. Right. So like, of, of course I will. <laughs> so the first song I learned with them, I learned on drums. Okay. Uh, I, I could keep time at home. Like a, my brothers would, would make me keep time. Right, right. So uh, was, but the first song I learned was Baby Blue by Badfinger. Oh, interesting. Okay. So it's a really cool song. Da, 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 don't go, go, ga, go. Yeah. Go, ga. So it was this. Totally, yeah. Different being that different beat than like Paul Cook. Goosh, get, go, go, get. Totally, yeah. yeah. So I had like two beats now. <laughs> You're off. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So, uh, and then I was playing guitar in another band and there was, there was really a time, most of the time in Seattle when I was a teenager, I was in three different bands playing guitar, playing bass, playing drums. That's so great. I mean, I guess that's kind of what keeps you diversifying because it's an interesting conversation because I know even like I mean I've read I've read your books I'm very well versed in the entire you know Guns N' Roses background but it's interesting to me that in any sort of slight change in your history you could have went I'm the guitar player in this or I'm the drummer in this you know I mean like one of those things could have led you in a in a different direction but the fact that um uh, you know, by the time you're actually about, what, how old are you when you're actually like, we're going to go play gigs and we're going out of town and all that kind of stuff? 
I mean, that was around 14. But that first, young. I think, you know, we used to be able to write. I mean, going out of town then was just going up to Vancouver, B.C. Yeah, it's still. Been, that's across the border. That's a thing, you know what I mean? It's a thing. I mean, it, where were you playing in Vancouver? Uh, Smiling Buddha. No way. You know, that was gone by the time I got to Vancouver. And it's always one of those, like, this, uh, you know, mythical place. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, I played there a bunch. And oh, so wow. back then you could... Um, you could cross the border with a note from your mom. So not anymore. <laughs> no, 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 no. And so we would forge these notes from our mom. <laughs> Epstein's you know? mom. Okay. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. Duff's and mom. Yeah. <laughs> we learned very quickly that you, you don't say you're going to play a gig. No, I know. Yeah. Um, yeah. You always say, oh, we're going to go see whoever was playing with right. the we are on, you know. Were you like traveling with like a, a drum kit in the van or anything like that? Or was it kind of like, we'll use something when I get up there or? You know, at the beginning, we, yeah, we, we, we used, there were, there was other bands up there. Yeah, that that's usually it. Yeah. And they would come down and play. So there was this trade off thing. Totally. Yeah. Who, who were you, who were the bands you were trading off? Like who was the, the scene back then for you guys? I mean, dude, it was, it was DOA. Like, yeah. DOA. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's like the modern ads uh, were great. Um, totally. Pointed point sticks. Pointed sticks, yeah. Subhumans. Mm -hmm. The original subhumans. Yeah, the original subhumans, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, there's a band, Bludgeon Pigs, I remember playing it <laughs> with. They, they weren't great. You know, a bunch of us weren't great, but it was yeah, we yeah. out playing. You know, we were out playing gigs. Well, still, like a 14 year old, I mean, because I, I did the same thing, except I was in a, in a small town, nowhere, playing around high school dances and eventually in pubs and playing a lot of cover music. But, yeah. and I, I remember having like between songs, we'd have to go, and, okay, the, the younger guys got to go stand in the kitchen or something like that. Cause we couldn't actually be in the bar, but yeah. you guys are like 14 year olds, like just playing shows and running wild in, in, in clubs with, with grownups or what? Well, yeah, there was, I mean, Smiling Buddha. I remember being out in the alley a lot, you know, if you, right. could, if you could look 19, which sure. at 14, I did not look 19. Yeah, but you were probably tall already, I bet. Just getting there, but you know, like the owners, they would look at me and look, no, you gotta go out in the back. <laughs> and the, the back alley wasn't a pleasant place to be. It no, was, of course not. You know, so you, you grew up, it was tough. You know, that, that mm -hmm. area of town was tough, and, but there was tough punkers and stuff. Yeah. And, um, but playing LA, you know, I mean, play LA, playing Seattle and then you know, we started branch off going to Portland and yeah. going down to San Francisco, playing the Mabuhe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Going to uh, L.A., playing the Cafe de Grand. Totally, yeah. Did uh, you ever get as far as D.C. and that whole scene that was going on out there? No, no. That's a whole other thing, right? Yeah, that's, so we had the magazine Maximum Rock and Roll, you know, right. course, this is pre-internet. and Yeah, of course, yeah. Pre-cell phone. It was mm -hmm. pay, pay phones. That's how you book tours. Yeah, it's so funny, right? Yeah, and... uh so the Maximum Rock and Roll uh, started doing a scene report thing where, like, you would there would be D.C., yeah, Minneapolis. Right, they had a thing, too, yeah. Uh, there was a Wisconsin thing only because of... Really? Yeah, D. Crutzen. Only okay. And Di Cruzen. You know, yeah, Cruzen. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and so there was these little reports from all over the place, and you'd, you'd figure out what was going on, and um, Chicago, and... But going to DC or, you know, New York scene was, um, I mean, there's a misfits from New Jersey. There was, there was things going on in New York. Sure. But that was so far. And like, we didn't yeah. have a car that could make it that. You, no. I mean, Black Flag, DOA had a fucking van. Yeah, 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 exactly. Oh, yeah, a yeah. van and a PA and that's so big time. Totally, yeah. How do you afford a van? Who bought that? You know, these I guys know, are yeah. rich. They're yeah. rich. <laughs> yeah. And then Black Flag came through. They kind of copied, you know, they were the, DOA led the way. Of yeah. All the American, North American punk rock. Yeah, uh, yeah. They had a band. They got the phone numbers for all the places to play. Crazy. Whether that was basements and little crappy clubs. And then DOA got the list, or Black Flag got the list. Interesting. And got passed around. And, uh... So my first gig ever was opening for Black Flag with Ron Ray's. When Ron, was, yeah, yeah. Yeah, was this he, he, he ended up in Vancouver. Yeah, I'm in touch with him. Oh, yeah? Amazing, yeah. yeah. I just watched some, I just watched Decline of the Western Civilization, the first one, the punk rock one. 
Yeah. And I'm like, I'm pointing at, you know, Pat Smear to my wife. There's Pat. There's Ron. You know, <laughs> yeah. it's always funny. But uh, so, yeah, I'm, in a lot of ways, I always think of this because, I, I, you know, being of a similar age and a similar, like, because I grew up in a, you know, we all kind of came up as kids watching, I don't know, Don Kirshner's rock concert or the Midnight Special. And it was all, you know, fucking Edgar Winter Group. And, you know, yeah. I mean, I'm saying like really like, like when I, I didn't even really listen to Pink Floyd. I've in, in recent years just been in, a, in this mode of like, like I was kind of like not allowed to, because once you got into punk rock, it was like your friends would come along and just say, no, here's yeah. this, here's, you know. And, and it wasn't like, uh, really militant about it but it was just sort of like you know why do you want to play like that those guys with the long solos and all that kind of, it was just the credo was sort of like it's we simplify we dumb it down and, and we get to the to the to the meat, meat of, the, of the matter but right. um to grow up in like 10 years earlier when you when you started picking up a guitar if it was like now you got to learn i don't know boston and you know like stuff like that it's it's a different animal but i i'm not saying you're not uh capable of doing it because of course you you very likely could have been like okay this this is what i'm going to do because you love music and you want to do that but the fact that punk rock was just so readily available and you didn't have to be uh you know emerson lake and palmer level of of, of musicianship you could just kind of dive in with your friends we all know three chords we plug our guitars in and go and you can do a gig like you know write some songs and yeah, yeah. yeah. exactly yeah so but i think that really advances you because You've been on stage since you were, you know, like a lot of people, you know, never get on stage until they're much older. But to be on stage that young, to get yeah. comfortable with that, gives you that kind of like that much ahead of the game. So when, when the other things happen, like eventually going to Los Angeles on your own, you know, which is a thing, um, I would imagine that's part of it, right? So, so you do your thing, you're, you're traveling around, you're doing your, lot, your, your Seattle thing. When, when, the, when the idea to go, I'm going to go to Hollywood. Like it, it sounds like such a thing when you say it, because there's some kid getting on a Greyhound bus right now in Indiana going to Hollywood, you know, um, was that a hundred percent? Like I'm going to LA and I'm going to do this thing. Or was that kind of like, I'm going to go see how it goes. No, no, I didn't have a backup plan that this no. is what I was going to go do. Did you even have like, I mean, did, did you ever, did you graduate high school as a kid or did you GED? I later on? Yeah. I got a GED then. Right. Okay. So, yeah, I, I kind of, I didn't kind of, I left my high school in sophomore year because right. we started doing these these tours and yeah. I was playing so much music, you know, I had to, I got it set up before I approached my mom about it. You know, only my mom, I was the eighth kid. My mom was pretty exhausted by the time <laughs> yeah, I, bet. I was around, you know, like, and she was working and, and uh, so I kind of set it up for me to go to this alternative school and okay. Kim Warnick from... The fastbacks, she was 18. Okay. So she could be my counselor, my outside counselor. Wow, perfect. And so she came up to no this school called Nova with me. And I said, I want to transfer to Nova. And, and Nova, you don't have to go to. You, <clears throat> you can just do the work and turn it in and kind of. And came oh, okay. And her counselor, and they interviewed her. And she goes, yeah, I'll make sure he does his work. That's so <laughs> you know? awesome. And uh, so I went to Nova and... Uh, did, you know, I didn't apply myself at Nova, and uh, I got my GED when I was 18, moved to LA at 19, and I, and I think, you know, I, by the time I was 19, I was in so many bands. Right. I was in a band called 10 Minute Warning, which was going to be like the next big thing. We, yeah. we toured with Black Flag, we toured with Ted Kennedy's, uh, we just got signed with Alternative Tentacles. We were the thing. It was yeah. the thing. It was the first, it, like, slow down Seattle band, you know, we... Yeah. Like, went almost psychedelic and was totally yeah um now you played what in that though guitar yeah you were you as a guitar player in that and, and the fascinating thing is too is it's like there's no glory necessarily in that world you could be like doa was if that's the top of the heat that's still like you know hotel rooms are probably uh a luxury you know what i mean like yeah there's a lot of sleeping in vans and and, and yeah we were crashing it at, at, at people's Park. houses yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Punk, there was punk rock houses. I, I'm sure that was part of the, uh, you know, when you looked at all the gigs, there was probably also, and you can crash at at this place in 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 Des Moines or in you know whatever town you were in. I'm yeah. sure there was a punk rock house to go crash at. So, totally. Totally. so that really sets you up for, 
you know, I mean, I guess by the time Guns N' Roses or anything comes along, you're not really expecting it to be five-star hotels. You're like perfectly happy if it's like regular gigs and, you know, and a, and a, and a warm meal once in a while, you know what I mean? I mean, we, we started as, I mean, we really had the, I gotta say, we had the punk rock. A hundred percent, yeah. You know, yeah. In the first tour we did where we ended up hitchhiking, that yeah. was that list, that DOA list that we- <laughs> Really? That's I amazing. Had the list, so, so without DOA, there'd be no Guns N' Roses, straight up. Basically. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We had, you know, we had Seattle, we had Portland, we had Eugene, at, and Eugene was uh, this guy's mom's basement. It was a oh place God. I played before. Amazing. And it was a proper gig, and you could crash there after the right. gig. Um, Sacramento was some other place where we played the Mabu Hay. Yeah. In, in San Francisco. And then back to LA and played the, the Troubadour show. Those LA Sunset Strip guys must have, you must have been, when you brought up this whole idea of going and do that, they must have, what the hell is he talking about? Like, you don't, you don't no, go just. No, no. no. Uh, so, so the band was at that point when we booked this tour, because it was like, uh, there was a couple other guys in the band, Rob. Yeah. And, yeah, and Tracy, mm -hmm. and it wasn't like is this thing, you know, to move to LA, it's got to be whatever you're going to do, it's got to be at 100. Like, percent Yeah, you can't have a missing a weak link. Not saying that Rob and Tracy were, were weak links, just something wasn't fitting all the way together, right? It wasn't right. Like, uh, to me, I'm just speaking for myself. Yeah, Axel, of course. Yeah, Axel was, I, I mean, I've written about this, this I know, thing. I know, and Axel was this like completely uh i mean he was like you know henry rollins and iggy and all of these great things and mixed into one i mean it was yeah. real you know yeah, 100 percent, yeah and he could sing these these notes and he had like this musical ability and all of this stuff and izzy was this cool dude like a johnny thunders guy 100%, he, got, yeah. he played in punk rock bands so yeah I, yeah you know, I brought up this tour i'm like this will shake out the band yeah and, yeah absolutely yeah it's just kind of, and, and as soon as we kind of booked the tour and, you know, Axel and Izzy was, they didn't care where we sleep, you know? This yeah, no, no. Indiana, I mean, I yeah. think Axel slept underneath cars and shit, you know, they didn't care. Totally, yeah, yeah. Um, we'll figure out where to eat. Well, it I, does separate the men from the boys, that whole kind of like, you know, <laughs> the whole frontier idea of we're just going to go out there and make me play music and, and we'll figure it out, you know? We'll, yeah. we'll, we'll find food, we'll, we'll forage for food, we'll, we'll find places to rest, yeah. Yeah. We actually did forage for food on that trip. <laughs> yeah. I mean, so we're so hungry, man, from the onion fields. But uh, it, yeah, the that, onion field. Yeah, uh, two of the, you know, those two guys didn't want to go, and it was it was the best, you know. Happy Can you guy. imagine if I mean that's the, the that's the crazy thing about these kind of like happenstance type things. If if that had not happened, if those if those two guys had not left, yeah, you know, you would be it would be talking about something else completely. Yeah. I mean, that's the strange thing about all these opportunities like you ended up playing guitar for some other band and it's a whole other alternate universe that we're talking about where you're have a totally different existence you know what i mean but just meeting the, the weird chemistry of of meeting the right people at the right time is such a surreal random thing that you yeah. can't help but go like whether it's predisposed or not it just seems like what are the chances of this happening when you leave for los angeles is it kind of scary like because you kind of bailed at nine, 19 years old like think about that now like as a father now i'm kind of like i don't know you're gonna go off to i don't know i guess because you live in los angeles it's not quite as scary as your kids just going to go down to hollywood that's a different thing but if they were going to go off to i don't know london or something like that and try and make a go of it it'd be kind of it would kind of weird you out but you know yeah i mean uh I don't know. I played in, and I traveled so much in punk rock bands and stuff. And I, you know, the, there was, you know, the scene in Seattle was so small at that time that yeah. also I had that, like, you know, some people were like, oh, he'll be back in a couple of weeks. So I had that other thing, like, I can't, I can't just come back in a couple of weeks, you know? Right, right. Yeah. I have to, I can't do that. And I think, you know, my brothers and sisters, who, the ones who knew I left, you know, were, I couldn't let anybody down. I couldn't let myself down. So I was, I was there for the duration, whatever that was going to be. Right. Uh, Chase it all down and see what happens. Yeah. yeah. I got a job, you know, the first hour I was in town, but I That's was always handy. it was in Northridge, which, you know, I was on the way into town. Oh, wow. <laughs> you actually like landed a job on the way in? 
Yeah, but I got and I got off work that night. I was man, I was exhausted, and uh, I was a cook in Seattle, so I I could get the job and kind of sure around and and uh, I got off work and I asked this, this older cook, I'm like, where's Hollywood from here? I'm kind of mixed up where I'm at. It's like, oh dude, that's 25 miles away. So, <laughs> um yeah when you live in la things like northridge northridge you know it's like <laughs> yeah everybody yeah. says like you look at a map and you're like this is like a 10 minute drive right you're like uh not in los angeles no yeah <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, uh so anyhow um no I, I didn't have a backup plan and i i wasn't going to whatever was you know i just you know, when you're 19 and you're like, like look you're an a-type person now you have to be to do what you do you've chased your thing Sure. Yeah. Made music your thing. You're mm -hmm. not. You're not a. You're not gonna. Hey, Todd, come on, dude. Let's go. Come on. <laughs> oh, God dang it, Todd. You're like you're at the door. Yeah, of you're course. Yeah. In the car. You're yeah, exactly. The car. Yeah. I'm you ready to go. Get together. You're, yeah. yeah. So. Yeah. Um, I think when you know, if you're 19, you're a type personality. You've been in all these bands. You've been close to getting there. You're mm -hmm. gonna finish the job. At least in your head, that's what you think. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. The job whatever's next in rock and roll, because, you know, hardcore had kind of come in and killed punk rock. Right, so right. next, whatever's yeah. next, we're going to invent. Right. Whatever that is. And that was my, my frame of mind. But it must have been interesting, because, I mean, it's one thing for you to land with the guys that you landed with. And, they, and you guys shared a sensibility when it comes to uh, uh, punk rock. You know, I mean, it's really weird, because I, I talk about Slash all the time, because he's this bizarre mixture of classic, you know, like, like the Aerosmith, we always kind of say his window is about this big. He'll only talk about Led Zeppelin and Aerosmith and very few things. You never hear Slash say something like, that first Cyndi Lauper album's got some good songs. You know, it's like, he doesn't have that kind of like, but once in a while he'll be like the first Cars album, you know what I mean? Um, but, but he's sort of like, he carries so much of a punk attitude, you know? Guitar yeah. players in punk rock don't normally play like Slash plays. I mean, I suppose Cheetah Chrome was a lead guitar player, you know what I mean? Like he would throw down, but... Um, but did you, did you foresee like landing in Los Angeles? Cause I don't think Guns N' Roses was the norm, at least in my perspective, like looking back, it seemed like the Guns N' Roses kind of thing did not exist, at least from my perspective in Los Angeles. It was a lot lighter, a lot more um, fun, party rock kind of chicks, you know, at least that's what it was, you know, for a while. <laughs> did you foresee landing ass backwards in like, I don't know, one of those kind of bands that would that, I mean, I don't think you would have been happy to no, do that. No, no, it was culture shock to get down there. And, you know, like I said, I wasn't, like punk rock was to me at that point, 84. Sorry about yeah. this. You know, no, 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 quite right. Um, You're a busy guy. Unknown caller. Well. We got a lot of those, yeah. <laughs> then I'm unknown. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, so punk, I wasn't gonna like go down and, and get in a punk rock band. Right. I would. It was hardcore. Really did a job on on what was cool and fun and progressive about. Did it punk. make it way more like I don't know violent and and yeah. crazy? Yeah. Yeah. Especially I that. Like, it got really bad. It was gangs, oh. you know, like punk rock gangs. Like you guys, this is what punk rock was all against, you know. Like, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. It's yeah. just about being individuals and being freaks or whatever you were. You mm -hmm. can come to a punk rock gig with 70s feathered hair and bell bottoms and people were just happy you were there. You know? Totally. It became strange when it became a uniform and it became a thing, like, which 100% was what it was kind of against. But I understand. Every movement kind of changes as it goes along, yeah. Yeah. I, I went down and I jammed with Chuck Biscuits. Yeah. Uh, I got there. Uh, Ron Rays was down there. Was Chuck, was he in, like, Danzig or anything at this point? Or what was he doing? I think it was in Social Distortion at that point. Oh, right, yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah, he was there a long time, yeah. And it was him and a, and a guy from DI. We just jammed. Um, oh, so yeah. you just basically, you didn't like suddenly find yourself on the Sunset Strip thing. You were actually down there like doing the punk rock thing. You know? Yeah, I was hanging with Ron, you yeah. know, Ron Ray's. Uh, mm -hmm. Him and I were good buddies and uh, still are. Mm -hmm. And um, I was amazing, just, like, looking at ads. I was looking at all the posters and all this stuff with the like, you know, I won't name bands, but you know, it's like, I will never do that. I will never do that. I will never do that. Yeah. <laughs> but it's weird because that was such the, the standard and it was sort of like the, you know, 
it seemed like they were just going down there and handing out record contracts to any band that was at the whiskey or the Gazaris or something like that. That's yeah. at least what it seemed like. But um, so the fact that you found these other guys who in an, in essence sort of flowed in and out of that world, you know what I mean? Yeah. Cause I mean, for me, all I can say is it seemed like when we were, whenever we talk about grunge coming in or alternative music coming in that massive shift, that shift happened with Guns N' Roses in a, in a really different way. Yeah. It seemed like there was a lot of like, you know, white pants and big blonde hair. And then Guns N' Roses came out and everybody went, you know, like, okay, now it's, yeah. now it's this other thing. It's tougher, it's street, it's, and, it, and there was a punk rock thing. And I think that your legitimacy, I think really, you know, I think the fact that you being there really sort of made it like. But and, slash, and, slash too, I got to tell you, you know, I've answered Slash's ad in the paper. That was different than the, the Axel Izzy thing. Sure. Slash and Steven, we, we, we went and jammed. And we, you know, he was Slash and Steven really, and Slash's mom, you know, like they, like I had like a sort of a, she got my phone number. She got my mom's phone number. She's the sweetest Amazing. thing. Amazing. Does Amazing. your mom know you're okay? You know, like, <laughs> that's so uh, awesome. Polo is the best. And uh, so, but Slash had this, like, you know, we went down to his basement, we went to Cantor's, you know, drank vodka, and then went to his basement, and he, he had acoustic guitar, and he just started playing. I'm like, nobody my age plays like that. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? <laughs> I played with some, some cool dudes, you know? Yeah, and, yeah. Like, I don't even know what you're playing. Man. I know. You know playing blues, and, but I, I played enough at that, by that point. I thought I was a KG veteran, you know, at that point. Sure, um, yeah. Did I recognize the talent? But the things, the, the, the immense talent that guy had. Um, but he's also not the kind, he was really different than what you would consider other great guitar players in Los Angeles, especially at that time. Slash didn't fall into that group of, you know, like the shredder metal guitar players who by all intents and purposes, those are great guitar players, but Slash was this whole other animal. And it was sort of like, yeah, he was playing his guitar. He was 100%. playing the guitar neck. He wasn't mm -hmm. tapping or sweeping or, not, you know, no. he was playing with something more that was, mm -hmm. you know, in his, he, it was his way to communicate. And it still yeah. is his way to communicate. Oh, know? absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And that's, that's a, a I'm not sure what he's doing right now, but there's about a 99% chance he's probably playing guitar. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, he, yeah. you know, I have, he, I have, uh, you, you have to house. yeah you, of course you know especially i mean I, I was taking lessons i was doing all this stuff and i started you know in my 40s taking lessons really getting more, a lot more serious about the bass that's so I cool i was unserious about it but i wanted i was really curious about what else i could do with the bass and um that's what i appreciate actually like um when i when i you know i only know because of my close proximity to slash but yeah he's he's a better guitar player than he was 20 years ago and he, and he's a better guitar player he'll probably be a better guitar player in 20 years than he is now because he's not one of those guys that's sort of like i just i got my thing and i just do it you know what i mean yeah. um and i think the same says for you because when i when i see the when i see the band now when guns and roses comes out it's like you know it's next level it's like you guys have have grown as players and as musicians yeah. and i think that really shows i agree so, i agree you know we uh we're still really hungry and very, yeah. very, very curious about our instruments. You know? Totally. I'm really curious about this, this bass guitar. I'm like, I see somebody do something. I'm like, oh, I never even thought of that. Yeah, I, I see guys. And, and I, I watch you play, you know, I'm like, uh, oh shit. You know, and I am not too proud to ask my friends for lessons. That's you know, so cool, yeah. Chris Cheney or Scott Schreiner from Weezer, you know. Right. Can I give lessons, you know? Uh, I, yeah, I had some, I'm plugging in my computer. That's what no, I'm go ahead. Um, Is the, uh, did you ever have the discussion, I mean, growing up in punk rock, um, have you ever had to deal with the guitar pick versus fingers conversation? <laughs> I mean, I just started playing with fingers about 10 years ago. I remember you well, more than 10 years ago. Yeah, I remember having a conversation about your fingers and I was like, yeah, cuz I if you could see that thing over there, the right. Lee Rocker upright bass I have in the corner there. Oh, I can't um, see it now. It's uh it's covered in things right now. It's got a oh, it's got it a is. it's got right. a yellow submarine uh and then it's got a Gene Simmons mask on top of it. But uh right. yeah, it's one of those things that I acquired along the way and uh, it it's such another animal that this yeah. right hand yeah. thing just chews it up like you can't 
I made the mistake on occasion because Slim Jim Phantom would come to Vegas, let's jam. And I'd come out and I hadn't been playing and it would just be like, like literally cut my fingers to pieces. Yeah. yeah. So I'm not really, a, a, it's, I've, ha I've had this conversation a lot. And once in a while you get that kind of attitude of like, you know, bass players should always play with their fingers. But um, I think growing up with Paul McCartney, Gene Simmons, Didi Ramone, you know, uh, Sid Vicious, I suppose is, you know, I always consider guys like Sid uh, an influence simply just by like the image of the, of the yeah. most visible guy in the band is the bass player in a lot of ways, you know? Yeah. Um, well, and I think, Lenny, you know, let's, let's not exclude yeah. Lenny. And, and Lenny, yeah, was. And Paul Rabin from Killing Joke, you know. Yeah, good point. Joy Division mm -hmm. and these post, post-punk bands and Motorhead. Peter Hook, yeah. Bass, from, bass yeah. was kind of the, the thing. Absolutely. And those were the things when I, just bass, okay, I moved to LA. My drum kit was a piece of crap. I sold that. <laughs> right. You know, I had a guitar. Turns out it was stolen from LA five years earlier. I had Damn. to come a couple times. The cops came and took my guitar. I'm like, Ouch. I'm not with the bass. Okay, I'm a bass player. What kind of guitar was it? It was a beat. So I had a Hamer special double cutaway, like a Johnny Thunders. I love those. That yeah. All my friends bought for me on 17th birthday. Oh, amazing. Yeah. And right before I moved, I traded that guitar for this BC Rich. It was a better sounding, better quality guitar. Was uh, it like a heavy metal BC Rich? What did it look no, like? No, no. It, was, it, looked, it looked like a single cutaway. Okay. Uh, Interesting. Yeah. I remember those. Yeah. 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 I don't know, it was, like to me, I thought it was worth more money or something, you know, like, okay, if I got a pawn it. Yeah, know, of course, that, yeah. <laughs> I was in that world, like to make paychecks and rent yeah. meat, you'd have to pawn, you know, like. Yeah, we've all been uh, there, yeah. Right, I was yeah. wise to the game, like, bitch <laughs> will get me better pawn money, you know. Exactly, yeah. This is my pawn guitar, but it's my <laughs> Um, I love that that's a that's an actual consideration you know how much can I get for this guitar if I have to pawn it you know that's it no totally After <laughs> yeah. making a big move I need to have an asset you know? yeah yeah exactly yeah no uh, one's thinking you're not thinking about resale value like how much is this going to get back it's like no how much can I get in the moment when I need dough yeah absolutely so, <laughs> uh, but 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 really like when when guns started and and like okay I'm going to be a bass player that's the first time when I kind of went all in on one instrument. Right. Okay, I, I was kind of going all in on drums, like when the farts and but I was playing that, you know, and it was it was getting like, the thing was, we were doing real shows and real, mm -hmm. like, and I was a real drummer at that point, but I didn't know any like paradiddles or any, you know, chops. Right, right, right. So I started to like learn chops, you know, uh, but, Again, I had to sell my drum kit. So chops are gone. Bass, uh, drum chops are gone. So bass playing, and I really, it was, it was Lemmy. You know, we had, I had contemporary guys at that point. Right, yeah. And post punk was still, I mean, I listened to magazine. Yeah. And that bass tone and that has chorus on. I like, ask yes. Kirk Block, what is that? What, how's yeah. he getting that sound? That's chorus pedal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Aha, I love that sound. So I used a chorus pedal. I yeah, got this yeah. magazine. You on know? a bunch of stuff you have course pedal yeah yeah, yeah. um uh a killing joke is a big influence yeah. on me to this day you know yeah absolutely yeah and paul rabin and um just you know bass playing not as really like i can play all these scales and all this stuff it's right it's, no 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 it's it's you are like you are a different animal as a bass player you are yeah totally you know, you're swinging a fucking, you know, like, I feel like I'm swinging a huge club, you know. Totally, you yeah. Club people. And you have, but you also have to be, you have to let the guitar player run. And you can't, you know, we, I would just listen to stuff. I and mean, Stephen and I would play a lot. I would listen to a lot of Cameo and, and, and Sly and the Family Stone. And, like, don't do a drum fill when it's, you know. A, yeah. and, you know, like, Stephen, let's not do the typical drum fill at the end of everything. and. Like let's listen to the guitar, what the vocal's doing. Let's listen. Yeah, I remember you talking about like how you and Steven would basically sit in rehearsals alone, like just the two of you. Every day. And like, cause that, that, I, we've had to kind of like, you know, really dissect that stuff. Cause we're, you know, you know, Brent Fitz and I are both, when we when we do the thing, it's gonna be like, let's do it. Let's not like, I don't mind when guys sort of put their own paint job on like yeah. their version of, 
it's so easy or whatever, you know, some song like that. But it's another thing when I'm kind of like, you know, it, it has to be the thing, you know, and, and I think respectfully playing with Slash, I want it to be as good as it can be. So we've had to dissect all those kind of like, digga da da digga da da digga digga you know, all these sort of drum rolls that happen in Night Train. And it's like, oh, that's every second one, or that's this, you know, we kind of know that there's, it's not just the drums doing it. It's like, you're always kind of like doing something along with Steven. And I think that's, that's a lesson that kind of gets missed by a lot of players. Cause I think, especially in this day and age where people are like, you know, this is the verse and they kind of just take that chunk and fly it up to the second verse. You know what I mean? Everything's kind of like blocked that way where you guys, it's sort of like, it's constantly sort of evolving and changing and moving in what for other, you know, you're not a prog rock band, but there's a lot going on. It's, I mean, there's some parts in there, you know, 100%. like where I welcome the jungle, I think probably has like, eight or nine different parts you know it's funny because i always hear the story of you know i don't know if it was paul stanley or whoever but producers going like this is too long and i always kind of giggled because as a kid hearing that song i just remember like you know putting it on and like gin in the gin in the, and it was just like you just you knew your entire record collection was changing it was like okay this is a whole new thing but from an objective thing now as an adult male if i was sitting in the rehearsal space with you guys i don't know if i wouldn't say the same thing this is too long, there's too many parts. Do you know what I mean? Like, just like, but it's such a picture perfect song that it should never be touched or altered in that sense. But I've heard other, like the other version now where the uh, bling, da, 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 the D to G pre thing happens twice. Like it, it came in, there's a version of it where it came in after the solo or something weird again. Oh yeah, yeah, we, we went to different, yeah. We, I mean, we just, that's right. Yeah, There's so many parts. It's, I definitely get the impression that you guys were kind of like, what about this? And what about that? Yeah. And all kind of sitting in the kitchen, just throwing stuff together. But what a perfect well, thing that is. Yeah. We go out and play the songs, you know. Yeah. That's the thing. Like, oh, that one part kind of just fell flat. You know? Right. Right. Like, let's, cut, let's cut that. And then, you know, also, we, Stephen and I work so hard. Everybody works so hard. I don't, I don't want to say it's just Stephen and I, because everybody did on their, their parts, you know, yeah. slap would uh, come in with like, you know, he, these solos that he formed. Dude. He wouldn't just riff. He they're, had, comp like, they're compositions within a composition, 100%. They, they yeah. totally are. And, and, and this, we didn't know you could cut, you know, if we went to record, if we got lucky enough to go record, we didn't know you could like cut tape. So we yeah, had to, I know, we, yeah. Everything had to be like perfect. Right. Like, you, know, you know, for, yeah. for, for us. Like, so we worked on all these bass and drum you, I mean, you play them. You know what yeah. I'm talking about. Yeah. And that was all so on purpose. We worked every little pe last piece of those things. Yeah, so you weren't thinking, like, we're only going to play 30 seconds of this and then, you know, cut in something else. You're like, no, we have to play the full four minutes of this song, top to bottom. Boom. Perfect. Yeah. It's... Yeah, which the appetite is, you know. I 100%. Mean, that's first or second takes. Is there even click track on that? Probably not, huh? No. no. That's great. I mean, hats off to Clink as well. Mike Clink, you know. Uh, I just worked with him recently and, uh, you know, it's like, I, I can't help but like Chris Farley out to him every time. Like, remember that time when you made Appetite for Destruction? I ask all these dumb questions, you know, and he's like, uh-huh. Because it's fascinating to me as well because there's so many elements of that too where Slash is playing, I don't know, like a BC Rich guitar. And he's sort of like, it, it just kind of, somebody, you know, uh, comes along and goes, here, use this. Uh, it's not a real Gibson Les Paul, but it's a, you know, that just, that these weird sort of, happenstance things happen and it just sort of alters the entire that altered the entire guitar you know what i mean like gibson guitars at that time if you remember you could buy a les paul for like next to nothing back then and then all of a sudden i mean, no i told him, him playing a les paul to me like then you yeah. know i was like that is so punk rock yeah 100 you know, yeah nobody's playing this you know and, and no no effects you know he's like a johnny ramone like I'm just going straight into the amp. What, what do I totally. want to back for? I'm like, totally, yeah. But uh, I mean, how much did that alter your life? Because I love those stories of like Sly Stone coming into your apartment. You know, it's crazy. Like Hollywood, you know, I mean, it's, Hollywood at that time must have just been insane. Like, because I, I know when I, I didn't even get down there until like the late 80s, early 90s, and the strip was still on fire. Like, they talk about it like as if like, and then 1990, January 1st, 1990, they closed down the Sunset Strip. No one's there anymore. It's still a thing, you know, but I mean, it lived on in that sort of, you could hang out on the street. You didn't have to go into a club and you would have had, it felt like you were at a party the whole night. Um, but was it, it must've been pretty eye-opening from Seattle. 
Um, yeah, so, so, so Sly Stone, yeah, no, I, I, it's my second apartment. Yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, what, I worked at, yeah, I worked at this, I was making 150 bucks a week. I won't say wow. that. I mean, I've, I've written about where I worked at, but I won't. Say that. I remember that. I've yeah. said enough. I've yeah. said enough. <laughs> uh, but, um, you know, so you, you do the math of where, you know, what I could afford to live. So it wasn't, wasn't a great apartment. But it's know. not like we're talking about, this is 1945 and $150 was a lot of money back then. No. <laughs> it's like, yeah, yeah, it's like no, it 150 bucks is 150 bucks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and you had a, a car and you had, uh, you know, phone bill and you had to eat and yeah. rent really ate up most of. Uh, of course, yeah. So, uh, so Sly Stone, man, I, I get moved to this place, West Arkeen. Yeah. Lived next to me that's how i met him like this yeah. little guy came out and like well you move where are you moving in you moving in here i'll help you move you know and, and he's just like what another fortuitous moment though too that the fact that west is just like you know in that hang and it becomes so integral into the story it's amazing yeah yeah i mean kind of every we were such a close-knit little group every new guy who person who came in was totally yeah. you know? that's amazing when yeah. Dell and all those guys moved from new york and somehow became our group i think they moved in to that apartment building or something, but Sly Stone lived above me. And this is a guy I grew up to. Of course, yeah. Fancy mansions and, you know, Sly and family stuff. I mean, there was, he's living above me, you know, and he's running hookers and he's selling crack. Wow. And this is not, this is a shithole apartment building. You know? <laughs> Where this is this? Building. Where in town is it? El Cerrito and Franklin. Okay, wow. Yeah, this is back before they cleaned up Hollywood. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We're still kind of like street and punk rock and kind of crazy back then. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, and that's when, you know, that was another lesson learned for me. Like, oh, oh of course. Okay, yeah. Like you, you can go all the way to the top and you oh, yeah. can fall all the way to this. And he, he came into my, my, <laughs> he gave me a tape and I wish I could find this thing. He gave me this, <laughs> this demo tape. And a lot of it was like, cracked out stuff but then it would go into this oh, there he is sly stone yeah there it is like mm -hmm. a moment of clarity but he came into my apartment <laughs> i had this girlfriend for a minute and she was hungarian and i hear i was i think i was at west west okay. next door. i was at west we were yeah. you know he taught me open knee and i i wrote it so easy in like three minutes you know amazing uh, but i was over at west next door and i hear this this hungarian you know swearing and stuff I'm like, I'm <laughs> over. and Sly had come into the apartment he'd knock on the door hey can I come in for a second she let him in and he went back to her bathroom he's smoking crack and she just lost it get the fuck out of here you know you oh motherfucker smoking crack and I'm like oh boy oh like, no my phone just got kicked out of my apartment is it's funny all your drug friends always just spend all their time in your bathroom <laughs> yeah I've had that a million times yeah, that's just uh, Mike's in the bathroom. Just give him a minute, you know, whoever it is. You know, it's like, yeah, 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 yeah. And um, I don't know how I got to that, but uh, but yeah. do you ever think about the alternate reality of your life? Because I mean, you're such an inspiration, and I and I don't mean to like to blow up your tires here, but it's kind of like one of those things where you know, I I never really had a massive drug problem or I was a massive alcoholic. I kind of got clean more just because I was. You know, I just kind of felt like as a, as a, I don't know, just to be in this thing, I, I took it seriously and I kind of decided, you know, I don't want it to be just a random night that someone comes and watches me play and go like, oh boy, you know, you know I wanted to make sure every night was the best I could do, regardless of, you know, whether a string breaks or the amp goes down or all those things you can't control. What I can control is going up there hungover or too messed up to play. And, uh, but I think the fact that you guys, this is, this is a testament to all five of you the, of the original lineup is that you're all alive, yeah. you know, and every one of you, you know, the stories, like you, you listen to the decadent stories of rock bands. And I think you guys are up there with the top three, probably top five, as far as like, you know, like if there was a, a, a Deadpool, as far as like, oh, these guys aren't going to make it. It's like, and here, here everybody is. Yeah. Um, but do you ever consider the alternate reality of like, you know, coming out the other side and never getting it together. Because the fact that you went back to school, you know, you found an amazing woman and yeah. had a great family and all these other things. Because there's, you could have quit after Guns N' Roses and you'd have been, you know, we would have been like Duff McKagan. Yeah, he's the guy, you know. I would assume you were financially doing just fine at, at whatever point. Uh, yeah, I mean, 
but again, it goes back to Todd, what, what we are. We're A-type personalities. Yeah. Now, and you never stop. Yeah. I don't think I can ever stop. No. I, I know I can't ever stop. No. So, you know, I like, I look at things now, like how hard I work out and stuff. And I'm, I'm starting to think like, okay, I got to let my, jo my joints got to survive. I know. Until I'm 90, you know, like, cause I'm going to be playing. So now I got to, how do I switch out my workouts? I know. So my, I went. We went to Eastern Washington, the high desert, last couple of days, and I, I went, I slalom skis to a still, like old school, yeah. you know, yeah. like, and um, I'm like, okay, this will keep me in shape. I, I should do this, and I, I think of these things now, like, yeah, I can do this till I'm 90. Sure, it'll keep yeah. me in shape. It doesn't tear. This is what I'm gonna do. I'm right. just gonna get these wild things. I'm just gonna water ski. I'm gonna, I'll take a ski on the road with me next, when we go out next, <laughs> yeah. like where I can water ski at. Um, it's not gonna happen like that. But, but do you, I can't even imagine how challenging, because you guys are doing like three hour shows. I know it's only happening a few times a week. You're not doing like five nights a week, but three hour shows, plus your workout regimen, you're, you're kind of like me in the, in the way that there are 365 days of the year, and I'm not very good at like, this, this COVID thing has been a real, uh, a testament on like how good are you at just chilling you know you're like okay I, I'm apparently better at chilling than I thought I was right. um, but there's 24 hours in the day there's 365 days in the year and I like to make sure I got something going on I'm not very good at like not looking forward to something and I think that you're a testament to that as well because you've always you've always got like a, a project going on it's you're writing stuff you know yeah. uh, and all that kind of stuff I don't know where exactly I was going with this but I, yeah. I think that it's inspiring yeah. as far as we were talking about kind of retiring at uh, after Guns N' Roses. That's yeah, I just don't, I assume that even if like, you know, even if nothing was a high profile thing, it'd be like, oh yeah, Duff does this thing. He's going to doing a thing over there. You know, even if it was like, whatever, you'd be doing something. Yeah. 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 H high profile's not, uh, never been the most important thing to me. Well, I think the, the, it was really cool when you did walking papers because that was such a like, Duff is here because he wants to be here because he believes yeah. in this project. And it was uh, such a, those, that's such great music, man. That was a, such a great chapter. Yeah. It was really, it was, it was an opportunity for me because I was really exploring bass playing. Yeah. And Barrett Martin is such a different kind of drummer, but totally. a guy you can lock into and a you know professional guy like jazz and all this stuff. But he was playing these just kind of tribal beats. And we had bass and drums were at the kind of forefront of that band. It was more like post-punk in a lot of ways. Totally, yeah, yeah. And Jeff Angel is such a like a, a Seattle treasure that I thought he should be a national treasure. Well can really I help should. him get there? Yeah. You know, can I help him and I anyway and the songs were great and being a Seattle guy, I often wonder this because when Seattle finally exploded the way it did, you know, it's yeah. sort of like I mean it, it really is history of rock and roll stuff was happening there for a long time. What was that like for you? Like going like I should have been there. I mean obviously you know you, you never you you never missed out on anything obviously but it must have been quite a a prideful moment to go wow look at all this great stuff coming out of here like history of rock and roll stuff coming out of it well i, I you know i didn't leave seattle because there wasn't talent here no I, this, when i left a bunch of heroin had come in to town and it really decimated everybody my, roommate, my girlfriend you know my band i know vancouver Every, was a similar thing dude it was I know like that. yeah I, you know that yeah yeah, it was tough. It was tough knowing a band that didn't have at least one guy who had a who had a problem. You know what I mean? Yeah. Often more than one. <laughs> yeah, often more than one. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. so I was kind of I got backed into this corner like, fuck, dude, you can't be the only guy who's not nodding in the scene. I know, I know. And just stay here and hope that that guy gets clean and it's not gonna. I'm too young. No, I gotta I go. I gotta go now. Um, uh, but then to watch it explode, like oh, oh, so to watch yeah. it explode, so so you know, the, I worked with Bruce Pavitt at the restaurant before I left. Oh wow, I okay. Started sub pop. Yeah. So really, it was like one of those. It should be in a movie somewhere, you know, like or, or a TV show, like because I left the la my last day of work. I'm, you know, I put in my notice. I'm going to move to LA, and you know, I'm going to yeah. do what I'm going to do. And he's like, I'm going to put out my first single because sub pop was a column he wrote. Okay. Uh, yeah. Pocket newspaper here. Right. Okay. Yeah. Paper. So uh, he goes, I'm going to put out a single on, uh, on and I'm going to call it the, the label Sub Pop. So I That's have so one. cool. Yeah. And it was kind of that day. I'm like, well, good luck. And he's like, good luck. You That's know? so and, crazy. Yeah. Isn't that and great? you just got to go so off and make history in different directions. It's so cool. Yeah. 
Yeah, so uh, he put me on the sub, sub pop singles club and Kim Warnick from the Fastback started working there. She made sure. So I got all the Tad, you know, all the first singles. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I was really, really happy for Soundgarden. They were the first one that came yeah. down. Yeah. Went out and saw them at the country club. I was stoked. Yeah, I bet. Allison Chains came down. I played with them, at, you know, at their first gig in LA and they came to my house. So we, I was like the Seattle ambassador. Pearl Jam guys came and played the Cat House. Sure. We got them played drums when we did Sonic Reducer. They played like, the Cat House? That's so crazy. Wow. Yeah. To consider. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's, it's so cool. What is so, I won't keep you much longer because we've been going. Um, what, uh, what have you been like? Have you found that this is a particular the creative chapter with this big, big old pause button that we had to hit during the COVID break? Have you been well, writing? Have you been what's what's your what's your plan? I mean, like, is there a book coming? Is there solo stuff coming? Because the last solo thing, by the way, was so great. And because you know, I I kind of live in that world as well. That kind of like I always love the idea of like making music with an acoustic guitar because I can go, you know, you know, I can go anywhere. It's just me. I'll stand here and I'll play you for, for two hours if you want me to, you know, if you pay me to. No, okay. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, that last album was, you know, I was just like, it just, it resonates. Because when people make solo albums that sound exactly like their music, it's always kind of like, it feels mildly unnecessary. But uh, I love that you have always done something, you know, slightly different and slightly more, you know, there's so much out authentic. There, there is. There's yeah. so much out there. Like, I... Uh, and there's so much more i mean god it's like a that you know i got a lot more time and i want to explore it you know totally. and, I, and um so you know i was mulling the idea of writing a third book and i really had this really great idea of this kind of social anthropology social commentary sort of book interesting because I travel so much and i read so much and i try to like hip myself and I go out and talk to people, you know, and I've done that yeah. for 30 something years. And I, I know. really thought I was in this unique um, catbird seat, if you will, of, sure. of, of being able to like, here's, you know, when things were getting divided in, in America and the kind of and Brexit was going on, you know, things were dividing and, and, and I had this opportunity of like, do you guys read history? Because this happened before, you know, and you, when you go and approach somebody on the street, they're not going to yell at you like they do on Twitter. No, you know? no. And then no. people are way more polite and don't talk about politics. And we have these Twitters and we have these social media things that people are now getting used to. Die. You know, fuck you, fuck off and die, you know? Well, it's always funny. It's like today I just posted the new ACDC clip. It just shows a little bit of a song. And it's always funny to me, the guy who will always be in there, this doesn't sound as good as this, or they always sound the same. And you're always like, who has the energy to like, just sort of be negative about this? I'm excited, a new ACDC song, that's awesome. You know, I'm, I'm that guy though, I'm always kind of, this cup is half full, you know, it's like, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's a good way to be, you know. I and, try to be anyway, yeah. 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 Uh, so, I mean, I really learned not to read comments because I was writing for the Seattle Weekly for five years. I learned that from Slash too. Slash never reads comments. He just couldn't be bothered. It's just like, because no. for the 99, positive things that one negative thing sort of sticks there like what's his problem what did i say what did i do you know? okay. yeah but when you put yourself out there like with your writing it's like yeah i mean the columns and all that it's you know there's a lot of bored people with a lot to say yeah and i you know there was i mean i have this this old story about the the velvet revolver forum that we you know it's first time you had a band forum so it's 2004 sure and I yeah read i'd read it all like whoa and there was this one guy who comment and he was like being negative, like you guys. Suck. And then, but then he'd be positive. And I started to find myself gravitating to what this one guy said, not using his real name, none of that stuff. No, no. Then we Todd Kearns. Him. His name was Todd Kearns. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Or, no, I actually <laughs> met the guy. No we way, really? In Netherlands. And this, we were like doing like, it was a, presented by the gig was like, we did had to do a meet, like a meet and greet for, for the company, the vodka company or something. Sure, yeah. And uh, this, 14 year old kid comes up to me. He's like, uh, he gives an autograph. He goes, you know, I'm, I won't say that what his screen name was. I'm, I'm that guy on it. I'm like, how old are you? He's like, 14. <laughs> I'm like, I've been living and dying. Like on what you have to say about my band. I love it. I love Lesson it. Lesson learned. Lesson yeah. learned. Okay. And uh, then writing that column for the weekly, I just wouldn't read. I try to make it a place like you, if you're going to comment, use your real name or. I, yeah, I dig that. Yeah. Or, or, 
you know, we're not going to pay attention to you. Well, and you know, too, because the world, you know, you're a citizen of the world. Like, I say this about myself all the time. It's kind of like, I live here, but I have been, you know, like, it's when, you've, when you go to Paris and you know where your favorite coffee shop is, and, or you go to, like, London and I can't wait to see so-and-so, you know, it's like you start to feel like the world is really small. And everybody has exactly the same thing. They want to watch the, the local sports team on the weekend and they want to get together with their friends and they like this music and they like these movies. Hopefully they've got a good, happy family life and the end, like it's like the, all this bigger picture stuff like you're talking about, I think is a really interesting angle. The whole, yeah. you know, like the, the, there's so much focus on what divides us rather than what actually brings us together or what the, the, the common ground, you know what I mean? Right. So and I, I'd read i read a couple of good books at that point and, and about it and, and it, I was going to write a book. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna go there and I have a lot of really good ideas about where to go with this and how would, would uh, the book would end and, and begin and what would be in the middle and I started I put some of the, my ideas to a few songs. I thought I I put out okay. like maybe some songs with the book. I got ahead of myself and wrote the songs first. You know. Wow, that's really and, cool. Uh, and then I, I was like, why don't I just do this with a record, a really soft-spoken record. Cool. You know, really, um, more people listen to music to read book. I don't know. Uh, but it was just a different tool for me to, to not give my opinion, but necessarily it was just, I thought it was like songs to heal and songs of real life. And uh, so I went there. So now what do I do now? I write songs on acoustic guitar. Uh, I have my acoustic guitar there. You have to have your guitars out, people. Are yeah, mine are yeah, mine everywhere. Yeah, They'll sit in cases and not come out. Yeah, yeah. yeah. you got. Your, I see your acoustic guitar sitting. Yeah, it's sitting there. It's it's waiting for me. Yeah. You pick that thing up and you're going to write a song. You know. Yeah. And so I do that. I have all these crappy songs on on my Garage Band, and then uh, I'm gonna, you know, I demo a lot of stuff. Is that going to be for future Guns N' Roses, future whatever? Mm -hmm. absolutely yeah. all these demos i have a little studio here in seattle that i i bring up a, a drummer in i actually but i played drums myself last friday on a, i remember you saying that yeah yeah i'm doing an allison chains song me and shooter are for this That's so cool. for allison chains and i'm like fuck it man i studied sean's drum patterns the dude sean came in the day after i did drums sean kinney's no he's no he's no joke he's a real like he's a monster player yeah so I, I got my drum track together. I put the bass on. I have the acoustic guitars on. He comes in. I, I'm getting my teeth cleaned, man, up here. <laughs> your studio. I'm going to stop by. I'm like, really? Are you, <laughs> are you stopping by because you're near? You want to hear? But uh, I, I was really happy. I played to a click. I ne never really played drums to a click. And I got, cool. it, I got it together. Drums sound. I'm, I'm very happy. I'm like, OK, I'm, I'm going to start going over and playing drums for an hour. Yeah, but isn't that rad, like, to be this far, you know, you know this far into your career and decide I played to a clip click click for the first time in in your life like that's such a cool thing that you're like yeah. you know you're still and that's what I always think is it's like this is what's left the books the you know the 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 music all that kind of stuff it's like but you're you're one of those guys it's like there's just because you've done those things doesn't mean you've you know there's always there's always more there's always more stones to overturn and find new new treasures you know yeah um, I enjoyed a, a, a beautiful summer in Seattle. Uh, yeah. the first time. I mean, I, Todd, I, I we've had all this much time off. I've never had this much time off ever. No, ever. Yeah. No. I've actually noticed the moon like waxing and waning and I know which night it's going to be full. Oh, wow. You know? Dude. And uh, the planets tonight, yeah. you know, I get my star map thing up with Sat Saturn right there. You know? <laughs> <laughs> this is now all into it. I've never like, I'm like going back, like, this is how people navigated the planet. Now I get it, you know? A hundred percent, yeah. So nerdy. It's and totally it's one of those things, like, if you didn't have the time, you might never have stumbled upon that, yeah. So yeah. what's the, what's, I mean, let's, let's cut, the, cut you loose, but the, um, what does the future look like? I know you guys got dates to make up, obviously. Yeah. And, I, and, there's, and there's been recording, I know that. I, I, I don't know how much we can divulge of that, but I know you guys have been slowly working on a, on a Guns record. That's so yeah. exciting. Thing, you know, things were, they're, they're still doing great, but COVID hit, you know, but know. we were uh, firing all pistons and still are. Yeah. But, you know, COVID hit everybody. My, my I know. band was supposed to do a, a, this great tour this last summer. Oh, wow. And, and, you know, we got our crew, we had insurance, so we got the crew paid. 
we had the yeah. battle of the first company. You know, hey, yeah. you guys a lot of money over there. Um, but I'm just, you know, I'm taking care of what I can, which is my wife and my daughters. Of course. You know, and I can write songs and I can work out and I can walk my dog and, and say yep. hi to neighbors and stuff. And I've gotten to know my neighbors a lot, you know, around the, where I live here. Totally, yeah. Um, it's just a matter of time before someone says green light, everything's sort of back to normal or whatever that, that means. And then next thing you know, you're, I keep telling my friends, enjoy it while you can, because suddenly you'll be in traffic bitching about whatever. And you'll think to yourself, oh, right. I was praying that I would be stuck in traffic going to do whatever I was going to do. And, and here, yeah. here you are. So yeah. soon enough, you'll be like missing your, your wife because you're far away and all that kind of stuff and, and all yeah. the things that go with what we do. So well, thank you so much for hanging out, brother. I really, I, I didn't anticipate taking so much of your time, but I really, you know, I've always loved you. I never even talked about the Neurotic Outsiders, which is one of my favorite things. And and and, and must have been such a trip being able to play with Steve and all that kind of stuff. But one of these days, well, we'll do it again someday. I'm sure we can find all kinds of reasons to do it. Is that regular thing you're doing here? Yeah, I've just been hanging out with my friends. So I'm probably going to, I'm going to all harass, you know, I don't know, Richard or Dizzy or whoever else wants to hang out. I would love to try and convince Slash to do something like this, but you know him as well as I do, that this would be like, what is it? And what are you doing? And what do we talk about? I don't know, dude. And I did, <laughs> he and I did, and I was really surprised. We did a comedic bit last R week. Really? <laughs> For what? And he was amazing. I could see that, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, it, it's the Postal Service, that band. Do you yeah. know that, that Capra Cutie, the Postal? Yeah, so yeah. I did a video of theirs in 2012. Right. Oh, sorry, yeah. Um, where and it, it'll come out, you'll see it. I can't it's, wait to see it. That's so it's exciting. A redo of the this postal service video that I was in eight years ago. Really? Wow. And now Slash and I are they're redoing the video with some of the same characters. <laughs> and, it's gonna it's gonna uh, go out to support the U actual United States Postal Service and oh. get out the vote. Oh, cool. Yeah. yeah, that's so important. I mean, what a, what a time to be alive. It's, we, we live in interesting times, as they say, and uh, it continues to be. I registered to vote people who are, who are American. Yeah, uh, you certainly should. Yeah. Awesome, man. Well, thank you so much. And please say hi to Susan and whoever else is around uh, yeah. that, that, that you know. I miss, I miss the Pacific Northwest so much. I, I've been trapped. Well, I've been to LA and Vegas and back and forth, but I miss, I miss it up there. I'm actually so happy to see you still kind of have, you'll probably always have roots there. I think that's so important. You know? I'm going motorcycle riding. I love hearing your voice at the airport and stuff like that. That's Duff that's McKagan me. announces the, uh, and you're like, is that Duff McKagan? <laughs> yeah, that that's is. so rad. Awesome, uh, dude. I'm going to go riding motorcycles with Greg Gilmore, who was 10 Minute Warning, my old punk rock band. No Another way. Yeah, that's we're going to go. So riding. awesome. Well, that's so exciting. Well, have a blast, man. I really, uh, I can't wait. Hopefully we'll cross paths before, before too long, for sure. All right, brother, man. Good hey, man. You. you too. Good luck with everything. Take care. Later. Big love. All right, you too.